Okay. Now, so Ivy, we're doing this for you. We're doing Hakel. Hakel is not easy. So maybe it'll help if you know you listen to this conversation. You can come, you can ask for an extra office hour. Um, whatever. Like I'm sorry your dog chewed your charger cord and I'm glad we managed to get through the first the first class. All right. So Liam, what did you think of Hegel? Oh my gosh. Sorry, I gotta pull him up again. I don't remember. I know I didn't get through everything. I know I didn't really get what the articles were getting at. Um or I at least I didn't get what the um the what is it? The ones on sex and discrimination film. I thought they were interesting, but I didn't know where they related to Hegel. Um, uh, Actually, the first day is just, you just read the philosopher. And then the just, second day you can read the applications. Well, oops, <laughs> I mostly read the articles. Did you like the article about um, the reviewer who went to the film festival with all women directors and that one yeah that one where it was the mermaid and there yeah, was the still the damsel movie. in distress yeah so i'm trying to remember I remember reading that one i don't remember the end though that's okay we'll cover it later no, um, sorry i'm gonna be scatterbrained today it's well that's okay you were kind of referred to it and i thought you were remembering but it doesn't matter i am so, remember yeah do you have any reaction to the Hegel or I'll just try to explain it to you I have no reaction I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be okay. honest Dr. Beck I came directly like I broke down at the end of last class because like I can give you more of the information your profession professor is literally just me and you um wait a so, sec let me turn off the recording oh okay. well I mean if Ivy wants to listen she can listen it's fine okay okay I just want to make sure you have your privacy yeah, Ivy, it's fine. Ivy, some other students know it. I trust Ivy. Don't spread this, Ivy, please. Um, anyway, so my girlfriend broke up with me, and she is immediately. She, I was told by people that she was already dating another guy about a day later, and then I was just like, no, that would mean that she was lying to me, and what didn't, and all this didn't mean that much, and I got confirmation from the guy today, offhandedly remarking on her that they are, in fact, dating, and that was tough. Right. So well, yeah. okay, so, so Liam, I never yeah. had that experience, and I just was in love with the boy next door, and then at age 40, after I've been married to him 20 years, uh, yeah, not that he didn't have affairs or anything, but there was this huge sort of uh, awakening, right? And my kids told me, right? Oh, mom, we went through that, like in high school or college, they could see that I had never gone through that, which yeah. is you have a crush on someone, and then it breaks down and you have to think about well, what was it about me? that I needed to believe this person was who I thought it was. Like, you realize you're creating this person based yeah. on your need and you're projecting your needs. And it's it's not their fault that you need them for that if they aren't really like that, but yeah. it is their fault to be irresponsible, right? Yeah. There should and I mean, be this kind of an honest awakening. I mean, people shouldn't cheat because then the the focus is on the cheating, whereas it really should be on the psychological. Like, what, what does she happen to need where she's so indifferent? Like, whatever it is, it's not me. Like, whatever I need, I really combine it with fidelity. Like, it wouldn't occur to me to be too yeah. fake. A lot of it. A lot of it is strange. It, yeah, it was a it's whole okay. two week it's ordeal. Okay, but that's what tragedy is about right it shows you the good intentions it shows a whole lot of kind of male female relationships and how they well actually greek myth 
has just tons of things that the way men and women get into dysfunctional relationships, right? Yeah. So I think you can learn a lot from it. I mean, I did, boy, did I, because when all that yeah. happened, I realized, oh my God, everybody around me has fallen back onto an archetype and all those archetypes are extremes. And it was the grandparents got all involved in all this stuff. And they yeah. fell back into these patterns that were, that were incompatible with each other, right? And yeah. so in a critical moment, people will fall back onto these extreme, these complexes. But if you can learn, right? Like, what was it about me? And I, I learned that it was really hard to learn that lesson, especially when you're trying to finish a dissertation, you got two kids at home and a few other things, you know, and you're teaching full time. It's to add that on to what you have to think about is a bit much. But anyway, um, I would say just try to use it as a learning experience, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The I was doing better the past two days and then I got confirmation that was bad, but a talk in ethics about types of justice and restorative versus um, retributive yeah. really helped. And I, Cause I was like, I don't want to be the person that's like, I want revenge or like I can hurt them too. I, I just, I don't want to forget and forget because forgetting will lead to, to worse stuff down the road, but I want to be able to just move on and be good with everything. Right. And so yeah. the thing that's interesting is in an ethics class, they have this theory, right? In Greek tragedy, they have characters who are doing it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's a different part of your brain that's getting educated, right? Yeah. And the artists appeal to the intuitive part, the emotional, it's just a different part of your brain, right? It's the part attached to the brain stem and to the instinctual drives and to all your emotions right are coming from here and then your cognitive stuff that will make it into a theory or whatever is up here and yeah, yeah what you really want to do is figure out uh yeah i like that theory but i have to reteach my emotions right yeah to sort of re regroup um anyway yeah, that's that again, this has to do with art and culture and all that stuff. Yeah. Ah, this is another segue. All right. Yeah. So love a good segue. Okay, so Hume and Kant. Okay. Hume didn't think people were gonna be like this by now, right? They'd all have a lot more empathy and they wouldn't do stuff like this, but Given that they do, his solution would be, you know, more empathy. Um, keep focusing on empathy, right? <laughs> Forgiveness, move on. We're going to have middle class. Like you have a lot of, well, I, I don't think that's enough. I think you got to dig down into that place, that dark place, you know, and admit what you're capable of is, a, I think, more self-knowledge then just keep telling yourself empathy, 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 <laughs> right? Um, and then Kant would be, well, just give yourself the moral law. Like, how would you want to be treated? Well, obviously she's not, she's treating you as a means, not an end. I mean, that's clear, right? It's a clear cut case. She's violating the moral law. The question is, what are you going to do, right? What's your moral law? Well, Okay, act, uh, I mean, his moral law is treat other humanity as ends, never as means only. So you shouldn't treat her as a means to get your revenge, right? Because yeah. revenge is, a, is an inclination that's based on yourself as a physical creature. So if you're really rational and you're following reason, you would act uh, the way you would want everybody to act, which is to forgive and forget, right? And you're yeah. saying that's not enough, right? You just said that, but that would be Kant, right? 
treat her as an end, as you know, a human being. So she has all this infinite dignity and worth. Uh, she just act on inclination, but you treat her like a rational mind, brain, right? And um, so that's that's where I think Hume's view of the emotions is way too simplistic, and Kant's yeah. view of reason is just not going to end up with a person that has integrity, right? And yeah. it, I would say it gets more and more removed from actual people and less and less able to actually address problems. It's the same principle. Treat everybody as a rational creature with infinite dignity and worth. You're not going to solve problems. You're not going to figure out where they came from, right? You just, you just kind of made yourself into a machine. Well, you're not even going to be any fun to be with, right? Because you're, nobody will connect with you. So you're acting in a way that's universal, blah, blah, but nobody else is, and they're not going to pay attention to you. And you're just not going to have any bonding with other people. Does that make sense, Liam? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. Oh. A little bit more, the, the Kantian ethics and philosophy is a really applicable thing, but it is very subject to like, what's the word? Not misinterpretation, um, dehumanization, I think, of, of the self. Okay, because it doesn't have emotions, it doesn't have... Yeah, because it, it, it takes out the assumption, that it, it puts in the assumption that humans are capable of being that perfect rational, perfectly rational, where I think a lot of other philosophers will be like, well, we're inherently irrational. And again, that fundamental assumption, I think, is where there's this big divide in, in philosophy. And that's also where I think most of the aesthetic differences in aesthetic theories are can be pushed to. Where Well, the gap between rational and irrational is a modern gap. Because that starts out with the assumption that we're going to build a culture based on the modern view of reason, right? And yeah. so the utilitarians don't judge our emotions at all. Just take polls and figure out what sort of external stimulus people respond to and then poke those buttons, social engineering, so that you can, so they'll come out well. And then um, Kant is just make yourself into a machine, right? Yep. And if you don't make yourself into a machine, it's because you're irrational. That's why, my God, we have to do wise, right? You don't even, we don't want. That's an, in, those are flawed, seriously flawed models for culture. Does that make sense? Yes. Culture yeah. aims at wisdom. And no, and integrity, right? Emotions, actions, thought. In every sort of situation, you figure out how to act in a way that maximizes flourishing. And it requires an incredible range of emotional capacities, understanding other people's characters and their emotions, what drives them, trying to be able to convince other people using the appropriate way of persuading, um, so, you know, it has to have an incredible insight about people and, and, um, it's not the thing about principles is that, as Aristotle said, your character determines which principle you bring into a situation and then how to apply it. So, you know, uh, your girlfriend might say, well, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't want to break it to him directly. And so um, he'll figure it out, you know, and then it won't be quite yeah. so painful or something like that, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And the principle would be you want to minimize the pain and the animosity. So, you know, having a confrontation would be pretty wounding, you know, to both of us. So she'll, yeah. you know, he'll figure that out and then he'll move on and he won't be quite as hurt. And 
you know, he won't, I mean, I, I won't say to him to his face, whatever yeah. it is, you're not good enough for me or something. He won't have that sort of really wounding memory, right? Yeah. I mean, really, people find reasons <laughs> for whatever I, they do. I understand finding reasons to justify something. And then when you can, either you think it out and you realize it's worse one way or better another way, there's hundreds of different lines of logic that you can go through. And that part, I definitely understand. Kant doesn't get that though. Yeah. Right? You just start out with treat other people as dignified. And then, okay. And your girlfriend, ex girlfriend, would think that that's the way to treat people with dignity, right? Yeah. And then the, the utilitarians also, like, they would just reduce it to just, you could have whatever emotions you want. Like, you don't have to train yourself to make commitments as long as it's mutually consensual, right? Or, yeah. you know, they'll come up with all sorts of stuff that really is degenerate, you know? It justifies immaturity, all sorts of immaturity. And people get so self-absorbed, they cannot be citizens. They can't. You have to get your emotional life together so you can go out there and be a decent citizen because that, I mean, we're destroying life on earth and we're creating all these wars because none of the Americans aren't paying any attention, right? And so you yeah. have to, like, you really have to develop your emotions in order to get, to live a, a, a decent life and keep a democracy going. But Hume, you know, just empathy, you know, just keep working on it. Yeah. Um, how would empathy, you know, how would you apply that? I can understand your point of view. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But anyway, um, and John Stuart Mill, the higher pleasures, intellectual pleasures, fe empathy, fellow feeling, and imagination, the arts. Well, like, is this helpful? <laughs> anyway, okay, so where I'm going with that is that Hegel looked at these two modern models and he was not satisfied, right? He came up with another view. And he, so, you know, he threw out the idea that you can just take science and make that into culture by using social science or by using rational principles. That actually culture is something different. And so spirit, right, that's what, religious traditions are about um, developing the spiritual, the geist part of humanity. And the arts are about that. And, and so you can, you can understand that, right? The education yeah. of the imagination. That's what I, was, I left off with last time is the education has to be, the imagination has to be educated. And we have to, um, and history. So Geist is working itself out in history. So he buys into the enlightenment thing that history is linear. We're moving, we're getting better and better. And also that the West is, is ahead. Okay. Yeah. And specifically Germany. <laughs> right when he's alive oh you lucky guy <laughs> so i mean plato thought i just happened to have been born in a society that was truly more advanced but then we completely blew it and and this is going to keep happening and so i'm teaching these lessons now haeckel did not think the germans were going to blow it but they did right yeah big time they Part of what really motivated those Germans was wounded pride, right? 
We're yeah. the country with Kant. We're the country with Hegel. We're the country with Beethoven. Bach. We can't let ourselves be squelched like this, right? We yeah. we are cutting edge of culture. I mean, I mean, wounded pride, like that went a long way, and Hitler really tapped into it. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm, it, I'm, it's what? a very common fascist play, or it's a common play for fascists to appeal to that wounded pride and then create the scapegoat which can then be targeted and eventually they can work their way through a totem pole and get whoever they don't want under them gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, that's, you sh that's where art can really, people are supposed to identify with that and go, I have that capacity. You know, I have that kind of pride and I could get that tapped. Right. Um, yeah. The thing that annoys me so much when Trump goes, make America great again, it's like America has never had a very high level of culture in the first place, right? We're a bunch of barbarians. As um, a nation, we've never had a, a unifying culture. Now, there are, there are cultural centers and there are centers with culture, but that is never extended to a national scale. Well, so many you know, Europeans brought their culture from home. Right, yeah. and they set up, they you know they reestablish that culture in the U.S. And but again, what you've got is jazz, gospel. You know, the African Americans uh, didn't were weren't allowed right to bring their culture. I mean, they were so ripped away, but they have some leftover stuff like the storyteller, right? The tribe had a storyteller, and that's what rap music is. They're yeah. they're telling the story, which I think is fantastic. When I had a student, you know, point that out. Oh my gosh, this is so cool, and um, and so I mean, to me, if you want to find an a real American culture, you go to the Native Americans, and you go to the yeah. African Americans. Um, but the Europeans, you know, they brought their own. And I mean, I confess, I like classical music, but I'm not necessarily proud of that fact. And yeah. um, I think it resonates in your brain. There's a lot of evidence, you know, that classical music is good for your brain. Not all of it, but I mean, like Bach is good for your brain. But it's good in that kind of Kantian way, right? I don't want to listen to Bach all the time or I'll get very imbalanced, out of balance. I, I like listening to rap because it, it's important. There's a message, the emotions in it are important for me to feel. Like I, or um, just, oh, I like blues, you know, these people are so down and they're singing and, and on the one hand, we don't want to create conditions where people can create such wonderful music. The point of it is, why do we have a society where, where we drive people to feel that way, right? It's not by accident that they feel that way. The situations they're in, the way the society treats them, they're just expressing this. And it's a, it's a wake up call, right? Um, have empathy. Like I would never feel that because I've never been that oppressed <laughs> or gospel. I mean, you know, Americans, every church has its music and I have my Charles Wesley hymns and all that, which are typical what Collingwood says. They're basically not the best music, but they're, they're marching orders to go out there and save the world. They're definitely a kind of secular humanistic marching order is the Charles Wesley <laughs> um, thing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. I mean, <laughs> I know all this stuff. And I used to sing old Methodist hymns to my kids at night because it's the only thing that came to mind. <laughs> anyway, I mean, but um, I the gospel music sung by African-Americans to me is like, that's the most deeply rooted because they went to church to preserve their sanity, right? They went to church to remind themselves that you are created in the image of God and it doesn't matter what the society tells you. And so 
you know, I think African American music is profound in that very deep sense because it's people reconfirming a basic humanity, no matter what a society does to them. And that's important. That, that's one very important function of art. Now in the Greeks, it's the privileged people, right? That the artist is trying to cut down and expose, you know, get over that, right? So that's, that's real art coming from the opposite sides of the socioeconomic uh, ladder, whatever. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And, and there's lots of other things too. It's just, okay, so um, Geist. So Geist is about culture and, and the human spirit. And he thinks, he Hegel says that in uh, Persian, only one person was free. So the concept of free is that consciousness becomes conscious of itself. There's actually no gods out there. <laughs> that actually it's the human mind that understands these patterns and governs itself. And so in Persia, the emperor, whatever they call them, was the one that knew that. Nobody else knew that. Everybody thought it was him. Everybody, he, he was this mediator between people and the God. And so he would dress up like a demigod, you know, sort of weird, special, and get touted around, right? And so in Persia, only one person was free because only one person had that level of self-conscious awareness that we create culture, you know? There isn't a transcendent God that does this. And then in the Greeks, a few were free, right? The people who created the myths, they know that this isn't really about, you know, some gods up on Mount Olympus. These are things that we've figured out with our mind, with our self-conscious awareness. We figured out these patterns and, and humans need to educate each other in order to have a decent life. It's not the gods. Um, but so they created those myths and all that. And some people just took them literally. But as long as it brought about this emotional move forward, that's fine. Um, it's just that only a few were free. And then I can't remember, I've got a, you know, page through again. It's just that one, two, skip a few, you end up with Germany during the Weimar Republic, it's a republic. So now people have realized that they do govern themselves and they do create these communities and they do, they decide how to structure things so they can flourish. And so there isn't any God who's mandating the political order plus Lutheranism, right? So in the era of Catholicism, it was the priests were the mediator between the people and God. And so the priests were free, right? They knew that this is, you know, but, um, okay. And so, and they used art to sort of get people to a higher level, but under the belief that, that it was God's. And then Luther came along and, and said the priesthood of all believers, this is the key, right? And he went out in front of the judges, the Catholic judges that were arrested him for her heresy or something. And he said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. And so he's prioritizing the individual conscience in determining what God <clears throat> is or wants, right? So now at church, nobody's the mediator. And basically God or Geist is realizing itself in history. It's incarnate, incarnating in history, right? So if you lived 
during the time of the Greeks. Even if you were smart and wise and whatever, you might get that level of self-conscious awareness, but it hadn't yet gotten into history to the point where everybody could get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a slow progress where more and people get it and they agree with each other and they work with each other. And then <laughs> just so happens in Germany <laughs> that voila, like the light bulb goes off. And now we have the incarnation of Geist and we can very deliberately set up especially these political communities where people are realizing their self-conscious awareness and they're enabling each other to exercise that and everyone is free does that make sense yes now can you just see that as him saying that the empiricists and the utilitarians got it wrong right yeah and science is just a tool, but Geist is the real force. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because an ethics class like you're doing doesn't, right? It doesn't go there at all. Like that's not even one of the options. And then the question is, well, how would you do it, right? It's just that people figured out a long time ago that utilitarianism and, and Kant, what is that, deontological and... Yeah, it's deontological ethics, which is the worst kind. Well, yeah, but people who love it really love it, right? They think it's the best and the only. It's scary, yeah. it's scary, especially when it comes to politics, like abortion is absolutely wrong, you know, make it illegal, oh my God, right? And the utilitarians say, we're not going to judge it. We're going to try to minimize the number of abortions, right? And so they're so polarized. And I think wisdom would say, let's just make a judgment where we don't, you know, we're not giving a green light to sex because society should have, uh, should reward people who link their sexual behavior to long-term commitments. Because, I mean, we need people to be focusing beyond free sex. You know, they have to focus on families and, and social groups and institutions and mentoring and citizenship. You know, they really should. You should have long-term committed sexual relation so you can move to a higher level. Um, so, you know, we're not rewarding it, but it's stupid to make it illegal because it just rewards dishonest politicians and it punishes poor people and it causes all sorts of children to grow up in dysfunctional neighborhoods. I mean, it just has this terrible effect on overall flourishing, right? But, uh, you know, wisdom would go at it from a different point of view. Um, and it would go at it from a more spiritual point of view, right? How many people are going to have the education, leisure time to develop this higher level of social life, social and political life, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So we want to make lives that maximize how many people in a society are free, are spiritual beings and they're aware that they're spiritual and they take on the, the activities of the spirit in the world. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the other thing is to reconsider now, go back to Collingwood and Berger, they all were talking about this history of Western society and how there's, you know, there's the Greeks, and then there's this, and then there's this, right? And what was the punchline for Collingwood was that um, modern life yanked people away from the countryside and their folk culture, and now they're in this industrial world, and it's sort of bread and circuses, and um, 
it's still possible to have deep and powerful emotions, right? But you really, you know, you got to do this. And the artists have to come here and wake us up and all that. Does that sound fair to you about Collingwood's, um, you know, he does give it some kind of historical perspective. And he definitely yeah. doesn't think that science has improved us, right? Yeah. But we can't go backwards. And I mean, the problem with his, where are we gonna get these deep and powerful emotions, right? Um, and then Berger, if you remember him, was that it was all a bunch of privileged people. Art is just this way for privileged people to justify their privilege. And at one point it was um, the Greek, that class, and then it became the feudal class. It was all Catholic art. And then, and he said that the docents, the people who are always interpreting, they're sort of Hegelian. They always keep thinking it's linear and it keeps going forward. The art keeps getting better. And then Berger says, yeah, but at that certain point, it became a capitalist. The art was literally a piece uh, uh, consumer good, showing people how yeah. rich you are, right? Yeah, showing people how rich you are, and then it became to perpetuate um, capital gain. With right, glamour. Then you use it yeah. for glamour, and then people buy stuff because they want to imagine themselves being the person they envy, right? I want to become that person. So it's based on envy and, and superficiality and all this stuff. So he says at some point we were moving forward and then capitalism completely destroyed it. So let's go with communism. <laughs> so let's go with socialism and then everybody's consciousness will change or something. I'm not quite sure what he wanted to do with that. Yeah. Um, but so let's look at what Hegel says. And then within that context, and then what happens, right? Is it true that we've had this linear um, realization of Geist in the world? Well, you know, people still debate that. And the way they do it is they say the arc of justice moves slowly, but it's still moving in the direction of women getting more rights, minorities getting more rights, sexual orientation. You know what, it, does that make sense? Yeah. There's some people who are still sort of on that enlightenment trajectory in spite of everything, you know, and they'll say, yeah, there were always setbacks in the, in the past, but somehow we made this progress. And of course, right now, everybody's worried if America is really going to go south and maybe never be a democracy, even what it was. And I, that's very possible um, because I think because China is just going to go green, China is, is they're hell bent on beating us out on every technology, the top 10 technologies by, I think it's 2025. I mean, but <clears throat> to me, as soon as they go green, every green engineer will go to China because they care more about life on earth than they care about whether it's a dictator. Whoever yeah. will fund it will do it. And I would too, if I were a green engineer. Yeah, and so I, I think that goes for a lot of young people as well as we are, as my generation gets more educated and then enters the workforce, we are gonna be more concerned with the ethical decisions of where we're working than I think generations previously. And I mean, I, I don't think it'll matter nearly as much to us where we can go because it's already difficult for us to move. Most of us have little chance of economic uh, success. So I think things are just going to skew to wherever the green things are being funded, like you said. Right. The thing is, though, I really don't like it when they when it's nihilism. Like, you're going to be a nihilist while we're destroying life on Earth? I mean, that, really? Um, but then they have kids, you know, if any of them have kids, like, oh, all bets are off, like, nihilism sucks. Like I want a world for my kid. And so yeah. really college kids need to like, wait a sec. 
don't be so wrapped up in yourself. Yeah, you got a pile of shit from your parents in the past. They've dumped all this shit on you. Do you want kids at all? And if somebody you know has a kid, are you going to not care? Are you going to be just a nihilist and watch to say, well, that kid's toast and that's too bad? I, I hope not, right? So as long as people still do have kids, everybody should be working to do what they can so those kids actually have a life, don't you think? Yeah. So I mean, nihilism, I just, I find it disgusting, right? I understand that you got a pile of crap and I feel bad about it because my generation knew better. But why do you think you solve it by allowing it to just get worse and worse and worse? That I don't accept, right? I accept you can blame me and my generation all up the kazoo and I'm sorry, like, but what are you gonna do? Every day you use carbon stuff, right? You have a carbon footprint every day. So you wanna commit suicide, we don't get any more carbon. Or as long as you're exuding carbon, you wanna to try to minimize or do, you know, do something to make, at least not do harm. <laughs> You can't not be behaving in ways that are good and evil. Every, everything you do has a value tied to it. Um, and again, that's an ancient view. That's not a modern view. Um, but anyway, so, so Hegel is, um, is he keeps thinking, you know, that it's, it, that's where I was going, right? The arc of yeah. justice, ultimately. There's still an argument for it, right? Does that make sense? And yeah. I, would, I would say that there's, there would be a lot more of an argument for it if we didn't have climate change. That's just going to destroy it, you know, any sort of pattern from the past because it's just going to change everything. Um, so that would be my the wrench in that normally you can sort of see that happening, but there's this wrench here. Um, and Hegel didn't think about stuff like that. He didn't think about, well, it has to be sustainable. Um, but he did say some other stuff. And um, the thing that's interesting is that Nietzsche um, despised those Hegelians. And so, I mean, I think his um, Superman, you know, Zarathustra, whatever, slave mentality, all that stuff was a reaction against the Hegelians, but he basically gave the Germans the noose to hang themselves with. But, you know, Hegel did too. Like, you can't tell a certain society. Well, I mean, I guess Kant did it too. I mean, Kant did it also that the West is just happens to be ahead and everybody will imitate us. You should never tell people you're more virtuous just because you were born into this society at this time. It's, I mean, Plato would have said we had the most opportunity to develop ourselves and our natural. And then, so we are the most culpable and the most disgusting for the fact that we destroyed it, right? Yeah. But these guys, the, the enlightenment and the rejection of the collective unconscious, these guys really thought that people should say, oh, I'm so glad I was born in France under Napoleon because Napoleon is this world historical individual that's moving us, you know, from kings or czars to a republic, right? And that Hegel did think that Napoleon was a world historical individual. And so did Beethoven. Did you know that? Um, I did not. Yeah, he did, really. But he regretted it after a while, right? They thought Napoleon, oh, and then he starts being an emperor. It's like, wait, <laughs> I take that back. But his... Fifth Symphony, where it goes da 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 da, 
And that's the Morse code for a V, victory. And it's about Napoleon's victory, right? And I mean, that's interesting stuff. I don't know, you know, I don't know a lot about the composers and their backgrounds and his history, but I wish I, you know, every once in a while I find something that is fascinating. Um, yeah. But also, but also, we're not learning these lessons. Like everybody believed in Napoleon. It's like, oh, it became an emperor, and it's just a a a a. Can't you recognize this pattern? It's it's off in the Greeks because Apollo, the god of reason keeps giving people these wonderful gifts like oh thank god and then somebody abuses it. it's like oh no no <laughs> can't people catch on nope absolutely not the enlightenment faith reason is the only way reason can create a utopia forever and it's the only tool that can that's it forget all that crap from the past all right so Hegel, Hegel um, didn't think you could go backwards, that Geist would just keep continuing to move forward. And sometimes it meant world wars, right? Sometimes that's what it takes. Um, so actually Eric Erickson wrote a book about Martin Luther as a world historical individual and that is what Hegel thought. He didn't write a book about it, but that's interesting. Um, and so you could think in your own mind of people that, that you think might be a world historical individual, right? They pushed culture forward permanently. Now, right now with Trump and the rise of authoritarianism, all the historians that are basically based, you know, the, the ones everybody's reading are the ones that are looking at it from the point of the collective unconscious, even if they don't even know that. Yeah. They're writing books called The Strong Man and they're using analogies. Well, you can't use analogies in a meaningful way unless there's some basic drives there that never went away and they never will go away. And I, you know, I don't even know if these writers even know that, but it's very important to keep in mind what the ultimate reality is behind all this stuff. That's why the strongman books are punching in a button. But you know, there have been things like this before, and it's just then that good old enlightenment faith returns once again, right? Yeah. I mean, Napoleon ended up an emperor. Like, eh, could we just get over the Geist in history thing? No, we can't. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, even America was founded on the Enlightenment, but not the Hegelian version, the utilitarian yeah. in Kant. So the Declaration of Independence, when it says we hold these truths to be self evident, that's Descartes. He's a self-evident truth guy, and everybody would know that. And all human beings are created equal, and that's both Kant and Hume, right? Yeah. Do you understand that? That our documents are the Kant-Hume thing. Um, yeah. They have this inalienable, and they have equality and freedom and blah, blah. And then the second half of it is this evidence that the king of England is a tyrant. So you define tyrant as um, taking power beyond what he is a right to do. So governments only have a right to exercise power if they do it for the well being of the world. And when they abuse it, they have no right to power. And so we have an obligation to rebel, right? But so they, they actually provide a huge list of empirical data to prove empirically, irrefutably, that he is a tyrant, therefore they're justified, right? So our founders were the absolute history's classic, in your face, obvious believers in that Kant Hume utilitarian model. And I don't even think most Americans even know that or even believe it. 
if they knew it, they wouldn't yeah. leave it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's scary that two thirds of Americans don't even accept evolution because our founders were science based, like science is everything. And you can't have a democracy unless the citizens accept science, right? Yeah. They would be yeah. totally freaked out. And spiritually, we don't have a democracy. Spiritually, we are not a democracy. It's only a matter of like leftover habits and customs that we have any laws at all. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, Trump is, doesn't believe in the rule of law and there's a whole lot of people that love him and they love him for that, you know? So anyway, yeah. Um, that's the enlightenment, that's our society, but that's why someone like Haeckel would say, wait a sec, you can't found a society on utilitarianism and God. Like Geist is really what makes human beings human. And so then, you know, you rewrite the whole story using art. Do you remember there's three phases, the aesthetic phase um, where art is the, the main driver. That's the highest level they could get to. And then um, the theological phase where um, you're getting to some principles of reality. And then ultimately political life is where Geist really gets embedded in history because everybody's participating and everybody's aware that they're free and their freedom is to give each other laws and govern each other. And that's like the epitome of bringing guys to earth is you can actually govern, self-govern, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let me go to, um, Eagle questions, Hegel summary. Let's go here. Oh, this might not be. Well, maybe this is the bigger picture of reality. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. A summary of his position. Did you read this at all? You can be honest, Liam. Um, that one's the Google Doc, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. I didn't read the Google Doc. Okay. Because isn't so isn't that the I, one that didn't pull up? I just pulled it up. Well, I mean, you can look at it and see if you read it. But I mean, I'm I'm giving the background story about his view of reality in this one. Yeah. So you. No, can I don't even. I I don't think that one even um, comes up. Like on the on the post, I think that one's the one. Like, he yeah, Hegel summary doc doc. I couldn't get into. Oh, okay. Um, you could, okay. All right, so I, you know, I think I'll send it to you and Ivy on an email. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. Because I do think it would help to get that bigger background rather than just, well, Hegel thinks art is this, God thinks art is that. You don't ask why, right? And you have, I mean, you have to look at the worldview because then you can learn from the past. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just everybody has different opinions and it's all relative and whatever. You're not going to learn yeah. anything. And there are some real important lessons to learn from studying this stuff. Um, okay. So he's against the whole notion that you can use science as a model of culture. Um, okay. Ah, okay, so then, all right. A work of art, um, only insofar as being the offspring of the mind. So again, this heightened self-conscious awareness, that's what the artist has. And they have it at the highest level that their society has embodied it, that Geist has been embedded in history. The artist has absorbed the highest level their culture was capable of at that time, right? Um, okay, the art insofar as, I mean, he goes, you know, 
His language is something else. It's the offspring of mind. It belongs to the realm of mind. It has uh, received the baptism of the spiritual and represents that which has been molded in harmony with mind. Okay, spiritual, I think, is again that Greek thing of living for the sake of something greater than yourself. It's that realm of immaterial reality, which is what culture is. Culture is created by minds that think of good. What is the ultimate good? What is, um, um, well, justice? How can we live in a way that manifests that ultimate good? That's all in your mind, right? And if you're a free person, you realize that's true, that what we see around us, everything is created by some minds, by previous minds and their idea of the good. And that's what we see around us, not people just reacting to pleasure and pain or people just giving reasons. It's just this much, much bigger um, phenomenon. Um, and you could, it's obvious to me that when your generation says, how could you possibly have destroyed the biosphere like this? Well, you have to go look at the ideas. Look at John Locke's idea of property. It's definitely ideas, ideas of the good that has driven us to this impasse. But anyway, so Hegel does get that, the power of ideas. Um, does that make sense? That's what Geist is. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, sexism. It's driven by the idea that women are not as capable of those higher order cultural capacities, right? They're not capable of in being engaged in knowing how to make good laws that promote human well being knowing how to govern practical wisdom and theoretical wisdom. They're not capable of understanding underlying causes. Well, then you don't need to educate them as much. And then when you don't educate them as much, they don't even have access to jobs and all this other stuff. But it was that yeah. original idea of what they're capable of at the highest level. So what's in the mind of the people who structure a culture molds it, you know, is has more of an effect on what you see around you than anything else. And so the Greeks knew that and they're that's why they're arguing about these ideas of good and evil. But they thought these patterns are going to keep recurring, whereas Hegel is saying, no, no, I've made this explicit now. Like Hegel thinks of himself as the incarnation of Geist, right? Because he's explaining what's going on. And so he himself thought that his books will be part, he's a historical individual and a nonviolent one at that. And so he's, he can literally lead this leap toward a higher level of Geist through his writing and people getting it and then being much more self-consciously aware and then being motivated to actually really do this well. Um, so the Germans need to take on their responsibility to the rest of humanity and um, really um, get us all to this higher level. Uh, and the, the, the British are all empiricists. I don't know if you know that, but Britain is empiricist tradition, analytic philosophy and utilitarianism and all that. And then the, yeah. the French um, tend to be the Kantian. Oh, okay, so Kant had, there's the noumena, the thing in itself. Do you remember that? And then there's reason is our capacity to make these laws. But you had to limit the impact of reason to say, reason just takes in the phenomena. Reason filters things out in a way that enables us to make these laws. 
but there we should think that there's something over and above that in the world there's some god behind all of this and also the human soul is free apart from there is a noumena there is this part of us that is what it, what tells us that we can act on inclination or we can act on free will is this higher consciousness that we do have choice and then also our choices it makes way more sense to think that there will be a divine reward and punishment because we think in terms in those terms and it doesn't happen in this world so there is good reason to think it'll happen after that there will be a resolution of this so that's that's you know the noumena is what he, what hegel will sort of pick up on and call that geist and say that it's manifesting itself in history and so that's turned into existentialism and all sorts of stuff and there's usually continental philosophy versus empiricism the british versus the continent continental french and german stuff like they're still fighting all this stuff and they're making Plato into an empiricist and making Plato into Heidegger and all this crap. But anyway, um, the, the point, the main thing here is that this notion of Geist, the realm of the spirit, and whether Europe, you know, whether the fact that you're born in a certain place in time gives you automatically a, a leg up on your morality, your, your culture, your level of culture. Um, but anyway, so the artists are the ones who are the most free and they're the educators to free up, liberate everybody else, make them more self-consciously aware. Well, Again, Greek tragedy was dedicated to getting people more self-consciously aware, right? Of how their prejudices are, you know, causing them to do all this crappy stuff. So re-examine, that's Socrates living an examined life, reflect on stuff. Um, and Hegel knows this, right? It's just that he did, he was very, very insistent that it's in history because that's a part of the enlightenment. Um, Hegel claims that works of art are higher, obviously, than simply observing natural objects. Works of God is the creator of the natural world because God is a spirit and it's only in man that the medium through which the divine element passes has the form of conscious spirit that activity realizes itself. Um, in the products of art, God is operative. Does that make sense to you, Liam? Yeah, I think it does. Okay. That's the artist that realizes that there is a spiritual world and um, we're capable of like being in sync with that, the divine element. It's not a personal God, right? It's the yeah. consciousness becoming conscious of itself. Okay, there's a natural impulse to create art um, because there's an impulse to, um, to link the inner life and the outer life into a spiritual consciousness. Um, okay, all right, so um, it's time to quit, um, but Okay, I will send this to you, although I think I have the summary here. You don't have to sit and try to answer all those questions um, because I, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I the, questions, the okay. questions might help break the whole thing down more anyway. There's no harm in them for sure. What? Um, there, if, well, those I have, those I, I have access to. I was okay. gonna say the questions can help break it down easier. So that I don't, if they were separate, then there's no harm and no harm and an F there, no harm in them. Well, the thing about the thing about the end 
if you really read the questions, it'll trigger your mind, right? Because it doesn't give you the yeah. answer. Whereas this yeah. list gives you the answer. And so it makes you passive. And so these lists are just, I prefer asking questions, right? Because it triggers your brain. You think for yourself. But I make yeah. these lists, I make these lists so you can see how one worldview compares to another world, right? So that's yeah. where that's where your mind is focused. Well, what what is he saying? What's not what he's not saying? How does this compare with Kant? That to me is where the real <laughs> flame goes off. But in the questions, it's just figuring out what Hume says, which because it's so difficult just to ask yourself that question and see if you can actively come up with your own answer would be your way of testing yourself to see, do I really get this or not? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so there is, there is kind of a reason to have one of the attachments from Hegel be a series of questions. Um, okay, because it is hard to read, my God. And I don't know. I mean, I just, the Greeks, what is justice? What is truth? Like, I'm really the flat-footed lady. Um, if you can't explain it to me, like, in English, forget it. And if you think somehow because someone's born in a certain place and time makes them morally better, oh, you're in for a big surprise, buddy. That was such yeah. a mistake. Um, but the thing is, we can say that's a mistake. But okay, what are you gonna do about it? Like, watch us destroy ourselves? Like, okay, they made a mistake. So what are you gonna do? You always have to go back, especially when I talk to college students, I'm sorry, because they're finally just realizing that their adult authority figures didn't know everything. And uh, actually, in your case, like handed them a pile of shit, but still, as the teacher, I go, okay, buddy, what you going to do about it? You know, you don't get to just rebel your whole life. Um, that's what Nietzsche did, unfortunately. Yeah, and he, he didn't, he, uh... do you Do you read Nietzsche? I had to read Nietzsche and some rebuttals to him for um, 20th century feminism because oh. he's, He's weird. He's misogynist, he was, right? Yeah, he's he became very relevant to the the initial arguments that we went over and the initial like um, um I think it was Derrida, Derrida, something like that. Yeah. Um, Spurs or Esperons, and that those were essentially in response to Nietzsche and. And in that, I learned a little bit more about him, and I don't like him that much. The thing is, he's very popular among philosophers. It just drives me nuts. Yeah. Oh, well. Whatever. Um, I'm actually, here in Indonesia, I'm actually doing what I really always wanted to do. <laughs> and you have to go to the other side of the world to find people who are like, hey, this is common sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can, uh, anyway, you don't have to hear about it, but I, it's important to, to learn these books, I think, because they've yeah. had so much impact. It's not because you want to honor the West. It's because here's how the West end up giving you this pile of tensions and all this progress and all this blah blah and they still keep selling you that like a commercial product they keep yeah. selling you happiness and and my students in bangladesh boy did they understand that i tell them you got to read this stuff because your mind has been colonized and if your mind is colonized it's hopeless right you're gonna you're gonna what what's on your mind is what drives everything and they they read it and they go oh my god yes uh, and, you know, it helps. So, yeah. but the people who hired me at Lyon to teach the Western wanted me to teach it as if it was about the good old days. Yeah. Oh, my God, Liam. So, like do you it, know that like a lot of people... 
people read these books in order to talk about somehow the good old days or that the West is best or something? Yeah, I think I think Kant is also a really good example of somebody that can then be used to be like the good old days where all of these things were agreed upon because they were like set moral values and yeah. wrong because they are wrong. And that's yeah. another reason I really don't like the ontology. But well, if you're in yeah. Arkansas, yeah, that kind of stuff in politics works because politicians yeah. can say it. It's way oversimplified, but it works precisely for that reason. And yeah. the thing that really annoys me is, is it doesn't occur to people that you can turn the same principle in on them. So the example is, I say to students, well, what if I run a company? And it's like, I don't care if people are gay or not, but I know if I hire a gay person that the climate in my company is going to be bad because my workers in general are going to feel comfortable. Uncomfortable is not. It's just I'm worried about productivity and I'm worried about profits. And so yeah. the government shouldn't be telling me because I know how this will affect the climate in my company. Okay, and the kids go, well, yeah. And then I go, okay, what if somebody says, some of my best workers are gay. I am not going to hire a Southern Baptist white guy because he's going to make them feel uncomfortable. I don't care. I'm not even going to ask them if they're anti-gay. I'm going to assume they are. I can't afford it, and I'm not going to hire them. And then they go, yeah. oh, right? Yeah, they're like, what? Yeah, why? I mean, That's not. They sense. can't imagine that they could have this turned right on them. And then yeah. I say, that's why a lot of businesses say, you leave your values outside. I want profits. You put up and shut up. You don't like working with gay people, quit. But I'm hiring the best person. You don't like working with Southern Baptist white supremacists outside of, of the work, fine but they can't do any of that at work. At work, we work. That is a yeah. very compelling argument because once you start bringing in morals, oh, well, I don't really like women with little kids working. You don't believe it, so I'm not gonna hire them. And you yeah. know, blah, blah. Well, pretty soon you're, you're having really, your companies are really crippled because they don't have the best people. And the average guy who runs a company is gonna say hell with that. You know, I want. I want profits. I don't give a damn. Yeah. So keep your morals at home. Um, which, I mean, the Supreme Court has started putting this stuff together. And corporations are having a lot of problems with that, too. Right? Yeah. Like they're leaving states that have these anti gay laws because we want to do business, right? We don't want all this crap. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, I don't know, is Geist really, you know, moving through history? Are we really making progress or what? Um, anyway, so next time we'll do Hegel again. And let me just tell you about that article about the women directors. Is that you yeah, could, it you, Hegel himself was sexist, but you could argue a Hegelian argument that the, the increase that women have reached this higher self-conscious awareness and they're aware that they're free and they're demanding equal opportunity and minorities have become free in a way that Hegel wasn't true at Hegel's time but it's the same principle of Geist in history moving forward look at how many women have have been able to re realize that look how many non-whites Right, look how many. So that would be a Hegelian argument for the same yeah. view of reality. It's just that Hegel was sexist. Hegel's application of his view was wrong. But you can take the view of Geist and just say, okay, since his day, we've had even more heightened self conscious awareness, even than Hegel had. So let's just take Hegel and run with it. It wasn't Germany yeah. that was the end. We keep going. That was his mistake to think that it was Germany and then the Germans got really arrogant, but let's keep going guys. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
that would be the Hegelian thing. And then the, the article talks about, wait, we're back to the damsel in distress all the time. And so that would be, well, maybe it's not, or maybe it is, or I mean, it is and it isn't because we have women directors, but wait a sec, we're going back to these old passive things. And that would be the sort of Hegelian, eh, this is difficult thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. that makes sense. I gotta let you go. I understand we're over time. It's also I gotta yeah. go to bed. I gotta get up. Yeah, it's late for you. Okay, you gotta go eat lunch or something, right? I I have a little sandwich packed in my room, and then I'm going off to the career fair. Meet new oh people. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll see you. Bye bye. Well, see you Tuesday. Okay. I gotta turn off the record. Okay. Stop.